I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here with you today. I was mentioning before that this is a challenging context, but at the same time, I wanted to create this notion of, of home of ideas for all of us and um, to talk about human mobility rights and the history of free movement as part of the European integration process as something that is lived and felt as um, a breath of fresh air. So please, let's forget about <laughs> all the constraints of the present. And I will try to talk uh, today about the, how we can recover the historical legacies that make possible this freedom of movement, which is part of these four freedoms I will talk about later on. So in order to um, convey the main ideas uh, I found during my archival research and during qualitative interviews I was conveying, I was conducting, uh, I wanted to show you this image by artist um, Ralph Gonzalez, which I think it's very metaphoric also of the European integration process. You can observe an architecture, you can observe an infrastructure which becomes a vehicle of possibility. And this is something I also saw reflected in, in the archives. I was consulting many different collections and documents. The concept, I think it's a fascinating one, this concept of space as a vehicle, which is not limiting, but enabling. And this sounds so strikingly <laughs> different to the present. It's like, not limiting, but enabling is a vision in the making. And of course it has conditions, but at the same time it has potentialities. And I think this is something that can empower us, something that can help us also for the present and for the future. We might have conditions, but we also have potentialities. And the idea uh, of being able to design a vision and the making of creating horizons, of transforming a space into a vehicle, can also generate hope that <laughs> we tend to forget many times. So uh, I think it's the right time to talk about this topic for movement. And I want to start with this powerful idea of space as a vehicle. And at the same time, of course, we know we are in a so-called age of disruption, but this kind of age of disruption has a ductility. And that's where we can instill our power, the power we have forgotten. And in that sense, I wanted to share these interesting ideas by two different writers. There's Harry Melville who talks about how our actions run as causes and they come back to us as effects. This is very much related to the notion of empathy that I think is very important. Also, whenever we talk about free movement uh, and human mobility rights in the presence, how our actions run as causes, but they will come back to us as effects. And then there's also, <clears throat> sorry, you know, Diaz, who talks about how the only way out is in. I think <laughs> we, we live this uh, very intensely also during 2020 and 2021. The only way out is in many times, but how can we empower ourselves with the legacies of the past regarding human mobility rights, which constitute a fundamental right to have rights. And in this ductility we observe in an age of disruption, there are some important questions that I think is fundamental to ask ourselves. So the first one would be, what have we forgotten? And this is something that historians can help you with anytime. So what have we forgotten? in terms of legacies, normative legacies and shared values on human mobility rights. How did we talk about it in the past? And can we recover those utterances, those expressions? And also, what have we lost of whom we wish to become? Which relates to a fundamental question of identity. Who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? through the policies you create and through the identity you build in an integration process. So I would say those are really important questions. And um, within this notion, I found again and again in <clears throat> historical archives related to the idea of space as a vehicle of possibility, there are some objectives which are also related to, to this current project I have. So first of all, I would mention the 
the historical implications of the idea and the ways of implementing this free movement of persons as part of the European integration process. And there's a very important question related to this main objective, which is how can all these historical critics we can find looking back in order to see vision as historians can be helpful to today's challenge regarding, for instance, migration or asylum and human mobility overall. At the same time, we could also ask which are the evolving modes of exclusion in transnational mobility in Europe? Because whenever we talk about integration, we talk about this transnational dimension. And of course, we come back to the conducting thread I was mentioning in my first slide, principle of solidarity. Which are these neglected solidarity and diversity dimensions of European integration? those which we have forgotten and those which we might remember. So that's why you have historians here today. And also, can we articulate responses to humanitarian dilemmas we observe in the present beyond security center conceptions of transnational mobility? So we, we always see this reference to the securitization of migration, but how can we approach this issue from a humanitarian perspective, from a human rights perspective. Was it like that in the past? Something we can discover and you are invited to come with me and <clears throat> rediscover these empowering legacies. At the same time, we also have the very important issue of shared values. And from a normative perspective, can these narratives and shared values be sufficient to mediate all these countervailing factors of exclusion? that are making us even question our identity as a project for the European integration uh, process. So in order to elucidate all these very complex and <laughs> interrelated questions, I was consulting some different but also interrelated uh, historical archives. First of all, I was in Luxembourg. I was living in Luxembourg for many years, six years. I was wor working for the University of Luxembourg in the past, and there I had the chance to discover the historical archives of the European Parliament. So that was really um, an opening gate. So it was my, my introduction to this topic. And then I, I was comparing the historical archives of the European Parliament with the historical archives of the European Union, containing many other reference and testimonies from different institutions in Florence, where I took my PhD as well years ago. And now, very recently, these two past crazy challenging years, I was living in the US and uh, there's something very interesting at the University of Pittsburgh. They, they, they hold a collection of all the documents from the European Union delegation to the United States in Washington DC. So from the mid fifties, from 1954 till the present, they have all communications, all discussions, all documents about the relations between the European community, then European Union and the government of the United States. So it's a way to complement um, different approaches to human mobility rights as a fundamental right to have rights, ideas of free movement and positions and, and changing, very changing positions towards migration, asylum and so on from the point of view of the United States and the EU. So these three archives constitute a way of um, complementing sources. And as a historian, I should say that they, they also entail some challenges in themselves because for the historical archives of the European Union in Florence, you really need to know who did what because it's, they are arranged according to donors who donated the, the collections or specific documents. So you need to know who work on what in order to consult this donor collection. And then in Luxembourg, you really need <laughs> some, to develop some kind of expertise in legislative periods. So what was decided in each legislative period of the European Parliament to go directly to that information. And, and then you go to Pittsburgh and you see that everything is arranged uh, thematically. So that helps a lot to have all this European citizenship and uh, human rights and uh, free movement collections, and they are all arranged thematically. So that was really relaxing <laughs> and helpful in a very complimentary way. So I just wanted to give you a brief overview of some of the archives I was consulting and where I discover some of the points I will talk today in, in this presentation. First of all, uh, when starting to 
delve into the issue of the history of the freedom of one of persons as part of the European integration process, we find this very fascinating and important concept of a people's Europe. And I think it was also very symbolic that it was developed when Simone Weil was the president of the European Parliament. It was in the mid 80s and it was really at this moment of emergence of the idea of, of free, the four freedoms, the Schengen area, possible move, freedom of movement of persons as well. Because whenever we talk about the four freedoms, there's always um, an insistence and um, a primacy of the free movement of goods and capitals and services and persons and workers as well come in the last place. And that's why many authors like Adrian Favel and others talk about the, four, the fourth freedom whenever they refer to the uh, freedom of movement of persons. So here, in this very first moment, um, the free movement of persons was seen as a means to achieve the single market and uh, as an objective to be able to create the European economic community. But at the same time, uh, whenever I was consulting these documents from the European Parliament, these parliamentary debates and resolutions and, and so on, they, they really insisted in a different perspective. And they re that really caught my attention. They, they talk about how the, the free movement of persons in itself, it was a seeding element for a community based on democratic expression and impact, citizen voices. And it was not a means towards something else. It was not seen as a means to implement the single market, but as a value in itself, as an objective in itself. So that I thought that that was very, very interesting. And that was put together with this whole notion of a people's Europe. And then you wonder, what is this people's Europe? So here we start to see this conducting thread and this connection with the principle of solidarity. And this is something which is so much forgotten nowadays that I would really insist on solidarity today. So uh, what did they mean by solidarity at that time? 1985 in all these discussions. So they said it implies not only poverty and evasion, but also the idea of redistribution and the sustainability of social welfare provisions. That was the definition at that time. And I brought you some excerpts um, from some members of the parliament. For instance, Ramirez Heredia from Spain here said that <clears throat> He wanted to emphasize the need to conciliate the creation of this European consciousness through the press and communication media with the socioeconomic development of the community. And he also insisted in this idea of the tenable welfare procurement for a people's Europe. So that was the meaning of solidarity. And he stated, I believe in a people's Europe where our parliament shows solidarity to those who suffer the most and those who have most to be. That was the, the meaning at that time. And through all these documents, you find a lot of, a lot of um, roads not taken, many aborted proposals, many initiatives we have forgotten. And I, <clears throat> I think that some of them, they're really interesting and relevant also for the present. So they empower us as citizens and residents in Europe. And for instance, Marie-Claude Weissat said that we want to build Europe for the benefit of the women and men who live here. And she meant for citizens and residents. With this kind of original sense of inclusive community building that is so typical also of the Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, it's not just citizens, but it's also residents, whoever lives here. And in parliamentary debates later on, you also see and find a, a very important document from 1986, which is called the Solemn Declaration by the Three Institutions of the European Communities. And uh, they mention this very important concept of how migrants contribute to enrich the diversity of Europe and how there's a need to promote their integration in society fighting against any form of discrimination, racism, xenophobia, to positively value the contribution of these migrants to the building of a multinational and multicultural Europe. And now I know this sounds very far away. <laughs> it was really a very important issue in this kind of discussions. And of course, you also have a connection when you talk about solidarity in this context with the idea of socioeconomic cohesion. And at the same time, there was um, a focus on the implementation of the, of the single market. There was also reference to a social dimension of free movement and to a commitment to socioeconomic cohesion through free movement. 
And I thought that, that was very important to, to remind everybody about this connection. Uh, there's another member of the parliament, Carvalhas from Portugal, who said like, we need to move towards genuine economic convergence. And this requires greater efforts to lessen the structural imbalances in the weakest economies. Of course, it had a lot to do with um, ongoing enlargement processes uh, since the 80s, Greece in 81, and then Portugal and Spain in 86. So it was very related to this context of enlargement, transition to democracy, converging economies, and the idea of catching up in terms of socioeconomic cohesion. So it was all very, very intertwined. And at the same time, what I found in, the, in these documents from the European Parliament was a very important critique about the overestimation of economic integration over a European sustainable social model. And there was this kind of early warning talking about how these social and regional and environmental fields will be key for the future. And if we don't do anything in this direction, this will become a political time bomb of the first order. So I thought that was very, very relevant. And of course, later on, 1989, you have the turning point, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the, the Cold War. And at that time, there was um, a concern, a real commitment to how we can address the issue of the integration of refugees, escaping from, from repression and conflict and war. And uh, there was also a concern about how privileging security constraints would be and would go in detriment of asylum rights, which should have the primacy and should have the main focus. So we see all these uh, critical early warnings though, against market priorities in, in detriment of social and human concerns. And this is one of the ideas I wanted to stress, as something we might recover also to empower us in this home of ideas to move forward and not just to be uh, shocked and managed by events, but also to have a stance and to have a word. In the future, we want to build, to want to have this vision in the making again. And um, the parliament was also very critical of how uh, other European institutions were sidelining the democratic control of the European Parliament and using the intergovernmental method and not the supranational approach. So they really denounced this, this idea of the, the lack of democratic control in the, in the Schengen process. That was another period that was towards the end of the 80s and up to the Maastricht Treaty in 1992. So at that time, the parliament uh, demanded the creation of, um, as part of the single European Act, of a document, of an analysis to study the cost of having a non-united Europe. And as part of this estimation of the cost, there was also the estimation of the social cost of having not having a united Europe, and how this was related to this idea of sustainable welfare procurement for a people's Europe with that focus we're talking about when we mentioned the solidarity principle. And um, they were also very concerned about the immigration for so-called third countries outside the, the European community, and how there was a need uh, to, to integrate this, these migrants, and at the same time, I thought it was very symbolic to, to bring this, this illustration, this slide here. Where are you from, Earth? That was this idea, this cosmopolitan idea was very much discussed as well. The belonging, the displacement, but also how the perspective of eliminating internal frontiers as part of the community would push harder um, the relations with so-called third countries and would create this fortress Europe that was so much discussed during the 1990s. So, so that was a time, um, especially at the beginning of the 90s in 1990, of the convention implementing the Schengen agreements. And the parliament was really harsh in uh, criticizing how those, the convention was implemented in, through intergovernmental means and negotiated outside the community institutions without parliamentary democratic control. And there was also this very controversial issue of sidelining the judiciary and judges in many countries, for instance, in the Netherlands, where the European Court of Justice reacted against that in a very strong way. At the same time, in the, in the early 90s, there was a, the war in Iraq, the so-called first Gulf War, 
and the reactions to that at that time, they were so different. What you can see in the present regarding uh, refugee and asylum issues, uh, what they said from the communities and especially from the point of view of the parliament was that the war in Iraq should never be used as a pretext for harsher external border controls, not justified on grounds of security. So they wanted to ensure that the war was not a motive for discrimination against non-community nationals. As you can see, it's like, well, that's so different from the present. We can learn something here. And that was also stressed by a key rapporteur in all these debates at the parliament, Hanel Tribe, who talked about how by lumping together legal and illegal immigration by placing on every migrant this what he called a permanent and systematic suspicion of guilt we give free reign to the xenophobic violence of some and a clear conscious of distinctive racism of others so what this key reporter said that human rights must not be a matter of variable geometry and i thought this is really fundamental they are universal and immutable the right of asylum, the right to live with one's family, the right to move about, the international conventions are not to be interpreted in one way for a period of economic expansion and in another way for a time of recession. And that was refreshing. I was like, well, <laughs> this is something we have forgotten again in the present and it could empower us to, to look in different directions. So um, also in this period, right before the um, Maastricht Treaty in 1992, there was um, a preoccupation very much expressed uh, throughout parliamentary debates on the so-called Schengen information system. And uh, again, it was a kind of early warning about the violation of privacy as a violation of human rights, fundamental rights, and how they said Schengen presented excuse for the classification, profiling, and follow-up of the movements of European citizens. So that was one of the first times there was a very big debate about the violation of privacy as well, a violation of fundamental rights and fundamental freedoms. And then there was a very important interplay afterwards from 1993 till 1999 and also in parallel with the war in the Balkans there was an eruption of um, xenophobic voices in the European Parliament and nationalist expressions and very much a <laughs> channel uh, through Le Pen, the father, uh, before the creation of a far-right party in the Parliament and it was part of all these debates on parental relationships, so-called EU sanguinis over the place of birth, the EU solis. So that was happening at the same time we uh, were in the Balkans. And it was a, a fundamental development in many directions we also know nowadays. So the, the key issue in, in this kind of debate was the idea of controlling migration and how integration was based on the full recognition of, of civil and political rights of those who legally reside in the community. That was part of the preparations for the 1996 Intergovernmental Conference. And there was this kind of insistence on the protection of the rights of migrants and refugees as a solidarity priority. So that was a new meaning to this solidarity principle, which acts as a kind of conducting threat through the history of all these human mobility rights discussions as part of European integration. And one member of the parliament then said, Coimbra Martins, we are all migrants, our, our residence permit is only temporary. And Mohamed Ali said from Spain, the key concept is the idea of the social cultural integration of migrants, something we might have forgotten as well. So in this period, the free movement of persons was not just part of the internal market, but one of the main objectives of the European Union to implement in a continuous way this idea, this principle of solidarity. The member of the Parliament Pellier said then that it was something that is, was standing against the whole idea of fortress Europe, which in enhancing its own security remains deaf to the appeals of the victims of repression and poverty. And that was again a very strong concept given to the principle of solidarity. In 1998, during the war in Kosovo, uh, there was also the um, entry into force of the Europol Convention in a parallel way and the, of the EU area of freedom, security and justice. And from the European Parliament, there was a kind of different critique talking about 
the notion of democratic justice highlighting solidarity. This happened in, in an interplay with, um, in 1999, with the Schengen Acquis becoming part of the European Union, uh, how the whole idea of the protection of personal data should be guaranteed without exception in any democratic society. So again, there was this, this warning against this privacy rights. No? And, and then I, I wanted to talk about a very important notion that pervades all the research and all these different collections on the framework of persons, which is this freedom versus security dichotomy in the Schengen area debates. And so I, I brought this very famous quote from Benjamin Franklin about those who give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Uh, what well, we can observe through all these different facings in the evolution of the free movement of persons in the European Union, it is growing tension between a democratic mindset based on the protection, the implementation, and the defense of fundamental rights and fundamental freedoms on the one hand. And on the other hand, you can see this erosion of the quality of democracy under a worldview that is growingly dominated by overarching notions of security, surveillance, and control. So I thought that it was very important to present this dichotomy. And just to share with you some of the conclusions of this study, I wanted to stress how in all these parliamentary critics, you observe a reappropriation of analytic and qualitative arguments by citizens, this idea of empowering ourselves. And in that sense, what they try to uphold is the idea of substituting any notion of surveillance and control by that of responsibility, the idea of social responsibility. I think this is something also coming very strongly in the present. And in their metaphors, in all these historical archival collections, they talk about a self-imposed Trojan horse, where the single market and enhanced security center political models will be the objective, and the free movement of persons will be like a concession, like an apparent reward. But it can also, they said, I mean, in the parliamentary critic, it can also be a neutral gift that we can enrich with contextually evolving social and political meaning. So again, this is our power. And at the same time, uh, they propose that we could find a balance between fundamental freedoms and rights and a respectful and non-discriminatory and non-exclusive form of safety. So what they make is a peace solidarity connection that we have forgotten so much because Peace, they say, is not just the um, absence of conflict and, and the presence of security. There's also an ingredient of community building, of active and community, committed community building that we have forgotten. And it could be recovered. And this would be also to prevent any possible involution of the Schengen area into the largely condemned fortress Europe. And in that sense, we could maybe <laughs> succeed in this particular version and approach to European integration, which consists of transforming conflict into cooperation and stumbling rocks into the stepping stones, especially if we manage to consider and to implement the idea that the European Union can be more than a market. It can also be an ethically committed political player, they say through these documents, bringing up the human rights, the solidarity, and the socioeconomic cohesion dimensions of the European integration process. So, in order to approach these possibilities, they talk maybe about a return of a people's Europe from the time of Simon Bale in the European Parliament, in which there is, there is no distinction between citizens, legal or illegal residents and so on. And we have this accent, this emphasis on the we the people idea. So defining, as I was saying before, of the universal declaration of human rights, which is linked to the notion of equality of democracy at the community level. So this would bring <laughs> the, the hope um, the potentialities of citizens' participative democratic potential and a transformative power which reconnects to the aims of this research center. And just to finish, because it's a sunny day and I'm talking for a place which is next to the ocean as well, I wanted to read a poem by Paul Oster and it says, I've been trying to fit everything in, trying to get to the end for it's too late, but I see now how badly I deceived myself. The end? is only imaginary, a destination you invent to keep yourself 
point. A point comes when you realize you will never get there. You stop, but that does not mean you have come to an end. And I think this is part of our power. Thank you. <laughs>